free Golden Eagles for War Thunder. Download the app in the description below. Hey guys, welcome back to War Thunder, and welcome to some of the most boring gameplay you're going to watch all week. And I bet you it's going to be boring for any of you who like kills, because there aren't going to be any, so I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there. If you're into kills, you might as well just click off this video, but if you like the idea of not having to do much in the sense of actually shooting enemy players, but rather maneuvering in a few specific ways to help your team win, then you might be watching the right video. First, though, a quick story time. The D13 that I have right here, with the camouflage, with the decals, with its stat card, dates back to June of 2013. That is how old this vehicle is for me. And it resembles so much about the game that I have pretty much almost forgotten. Back in 2013, I started playing the game, and I went from arcade to realistic battles, and after getting hooked by the game modes, I decided to purchase the Ultra Advanced Starter Pack. It was something like 100 euros, and it enabled uh, or opened up my world to a bunch of premiums, including the uh, XP-38G, the A6M5 Co. Ryzen, the D13, Typhoon Mark 1B, and I think the Peshkan, the pretty rare TU2. Now, obviously, when I first unlocked the D13 and started playing it, I was very inexperienced in the game. The matchmaker looked different. There was also a lot of AI. For those of you who recall this, MVPs, if you've been around for this long, everything sort of reminds me of this nostalgic War Thunder, what, what War Thunder used to be, which was just the air realistic battle aspect. And it used to be called, uh, not realistic, but it used to be called historical battles. So, a lot has changed. The plane has remained more or less the same. The camouflage still retains its original look. There hasn't been a lot of work done on the visual aspect. Now, how the performance has changed over the years, I couldn't tell you, because, again, from out of the couple of hundred planes we have in the game, there's no way I can actively play every single one of them, every single patch. So, obviously, there's going to be certain discrepancies. But the reason the D13 still stays with me as one of those, not, not so much nostalgic, but memorable planes, is because it's still good it still retains that state of what I would say is the best German tier 4 premium plane. Now, do keep in mind I'm biased here, because this plane, you know, we date back three and a half years. Obviously, I'm going to be saying this is one of my favorite planes, but it's purely because this is what not just got me into realistic battles, this got me to improve my playstyle, this got me to learn. And this is where an important the factor has to be made. I know that a lot of people are annoyed by premiums in the game, um, the T29 was an outburst of the community, now the IU251 I hear people complain about. There's always the expressions of pay-to-win being used, even though pay to, uh, as far as I'm aware, and I've played through the entire game, I don't see where there's any kind of pay-to-win aspect to it. There's pay-to-progress, but that's how a grind game is run, so it's nothing out of the usual. What I don't understand is why there's always this complaint about the so-called Wallet Warrior. Now, what a Wallet Warrior is, is it, it's, a, it's a funky expression for people who purchase premiums at Tier 4, giving themselves access to top-tier matchmaker without having played a single game in said game mode or maybe even said battle rating. So, that's a problem. Yes, it is. Especially when an entire tech tree is being spammed out. But this also happens because a vehicle is new. So, if right now you're complaining about the RU251, the uh, new German 6.7 tank with HeatFS and Hesh, I would highly recommend you wait. Wait about a month, the spam will subside and problem will be solved. It's always the case. When a vehicle is newly introduced, a lot of people want to get it, it's hype. Um, a lot of people are making YouTube videos on it. It's obviously something that people want to try out and play with themselves. So whether they have the experience or not, they will buy the vehicle, they'll play it. When it comes to long-term investments into a premium vehicle like the D13, which is something you want to purchase, you want to use over an extensive amount of time to not just unlock vehicles in the matchmaker or the tech tree, but also learn how to fly. And because of that, I don't think that Wally Warriors are negatively affecting the game, and I don't think there's really any premium in the game that truly ruins it or ruins the overall experience. And mainly the reason I say this is because when I played this plane, I was one of the biggest noobs possible. That was really my all-time low, because I was entering realistic battles. I was unaware how the matchmaker works, I was unaware of the mechanics, I was unaware of the spotting system, unaware how the guns have to be led. There was no indicators, you know, 
the, this plane got me from a zero to a hero. And that, ironically enough, is going to be the title of this video because the, the involvement of the match you're watching is exactly the same. Now, if for the duration of my side climbing adventure you've, uh, you've spent time maybe playing the game, not paying attention to the video, now would be the time that you slowly start to move your eyes over to the YouTube page and look at what's happening on the screen. Now, I've isolated myself from my team and I started chasing after a lonely Lancaster. Now, I, I feel bad for the Lancaster, I feel bad for most bombers that I chase down, but... I have a very um, love-hate relationship with bombers. I don't really like killing them too much, especially when they're climbing to space or going around the entire map to go to the airfield. However, I do have a fun time spading them every once in a while because, well, there's a couple of tactics you can introduce to play bombers to make them fun, fast, and effective. Climbing to space or climbing around the side of the map is usually not the way to go. Now, the way I decided to engage this Lancaster was from above. Reasons being that the rear turret is the one that's most powerful with, I believe, four 7.7s. Whatever it is, I want to make an approach to minimize the amount of damage he can possibly put into me and maximize the amount of damage I can put into only one of his wings. When killing bombers, there's really three ways that I go around it. You can go for the elevator controls and disable the bomber. You can go for the pilot if engaging it from a yeah, well, I'd say in front or roughly from above in front, which means that you can snipe the pilot and get an easy kill. Or you go for the wings slash engines. Now, the Lancaster is dead. He's clearly diving away because he's lost control of his wing. His aileron's been blown off. However, I'm not going to get the kill for that. And that is an issue with not the guns, not the aim, not the bomber, but the way kills are awarded. Kills are awarded for receiving damage, which is critical damage. If normal damage is done, an aircraft has to die within a certain amount of time for the kill to be awarded to the last person that committed damage to the bomber. This is something that I would love to see reworked, but for the sake of the game, since I wasn't unlocking anything here, or since I wasn't spading, I really didn't take it to heart that I wasn't awarded that kill. I was here in this match to see how the plane performs for all time's sake, so I guess this was the very first time, and probably the last time, that I wasn't very salty about not getting a kill that was righteously deserved. And the match really went here from bad to slightly worse, because I'm now below two Spitfires, two Griffin Spitfires, which have massive performance at the particular altitude, and I'm not in a turn fighter, which means I'm going to have to use a slightly different set of tactics to try to evade them or get out of harm's way. Now, if you've ever seen me in a match and I put smoke on, that means that I am baiting. I try to use this in universal language. I try to talk about this as much as possible during my live streams, but I tend to put smoke on purely in instances where I'm engaged with an enemy player or I want to drag them down low. Now, the reason I do this is because obviously I don't use chat in the game, and I do think that chat is great if you have it on. For me, it's a little bit annoying. I do think it's a consumption of time, and it takes my uh, focus away from the actual match. Smoke is an in-game thing. Everybody has access to it, so I don't see why you wouldn't use smoke as an indication for your teammates as a quick message to say, hey, I'm baiting, come take the easy kill. And luckily enough for me, in this particular engagement here against the two Spitfires, I had one other Fockwolf helping me out. And to maximize our effective baiting skills here, what we want to do is we want to separate the two Spitfires as far as possible, meaning that we're sort of engaging them in a cross pattern of, a, of an Infinity or an 8. So what's happening is, is that I'm trying to get the Fockwolf to engage one guy whilst I'm keeping the other one busy. Now, the evasive maneuvers I'm using here are simple rolls. There's nothing else you have to do against Spitfires. Slight throttle control if you want to get into overshoot, but the Spitfire Mark IX has a very bad roll rate. Well, not bad, but worse than that of the Focke-Wolf, so I can use it into my advantage. However, no maneuver is ever performed without the slightest mistake, and as I'm exiting the top of the, the roll a little bit too slowly, the Spitfire puts a nice hit into me. I'm leaking oil, I've got damage over most of my control surfaces, but nothing too serious. The D9 finishes off the Spitfire, which means it's now a 2 versus 1. Now, the Spitfire Mark IX is still above us, so he's got the advantage, and my plane is pretty crippled, or at least it will become progressively more crippled if I keep pushing the engine with its current temperature of the oil. And this is where I have to make an important decision. The D9, as far as I'm aware, is still undamaged, which means he's in a better position to fight the Spitfire than I am. Best decision here was, in my opinion, to go after the Spitfire, try to get him off of the 6 of the D9, and then get him to re-engage me, as I am the less important player, or at least less capable player, in this point to continue carrying on the fight. So I put the plane up into a very 
kind of last ditch attempt, zoom climb, stall myself out on top, and luckily enough, the Spitfire goes away from the D9 and re-engages me. So what do we do? Simply put smoke back on, we re-engage in the bait, and this is where the second mistake is made. I pretty much get a bunch of hits in, I'm evading very poorly, and I also lose both of my flaps, which results into what could have later on helped me out in the slight maneuvering, but still, plain as damaged as it was, I was very surprised how well it pulled out the uh, falling performance. Now, if you uh, swap your look right now to the top left corner, you'll see that the engine is overheating, the numbers are reaching red levels, they're flashing, which means that with the current engine, I don't think I have more than about two and a half minutes of engine performance left before it dies, and I'm in a low altitude turn fight with the Spitfire Mark 9. Yeah, there's no way this is going to end well, but I'm trying to buy time. The D13 hopefully is going to turn around, I'm... I'm I'm kind of hoping he comes back here, gets this Spitfire off of my 6. I'm just buying time here. I'm trying to push this plane into an absolute last-ditch effort zoom climb, and I'm just trying to buy time for a teammate to swoop into the area. But with the Spitfire so close, I mean, it's dangerous that if anybody comes by, they might as well just shoot me in the process. And then a K4 comes and manages to snipe the Spitfire when he was pretty much about a couple of feet away from me. Huge shout out to the guy in the K4. I know I'm not a bad shot myself, but in a situation like that, if I was in the K4, I probably would have killed myself in the process. So, uh, yeah, kudos to the team, kudos for taking the bait, and the last ring player is in a B17. Now, I'm going to try to trail him down, uh, as the engine is dead and as I know he's the last remaining player, I didn't see much of a point to return back to the airfield, so I just thought I'd turn around, I would push the engine to the absolute max and uh, see if I can get maybe a you know lucky hit into him and get a kill assist. It doesn't happen, but I also don't crash before the end of the match, which means that we get to exit with no deaths to our name. Now, to finish with the remainder of this match, I guess what I'll talk about is a quick tip for the D13, if you're flying it actually for the intention of getting kills and unlocking things. Defensive flying is great, but in Focke-Wulf, defensive flying is what makes the most fun, but it's also what makes the most challenging. If you want to make the full effective workload of the D13 work out for you, I would probably say get a decent amount of altitude, stick to boom and zooming, and if the occasional head-on pops up and you're comfortable with air targets or stealth, which is the only two belts that I recommend using on the MG151s, I think nose mounted guns, you can pull a head-on pass or two, it's definitely a capable plane of doing so, uh, but you might have to practice with your aim. Now, which plane should you be wary about? Well, I definitely say the Griffin Spitfires, the FRF-1B Bearcat, those are going to be the biggest um, kind of Achilles heels of the D13. Everything else you should not really have too much of a struggle against. And with all this talk about the nostalgic value of three and a half years ago when I first unlocked this plane, does it keep up to that standard? Does it still make me happy of uh, having played so many matches in it? Hands down, yes. This is a one and a hell of a plane, and if you're looking for a TFO premium to spade your German, uh, your German aircraft to unlock them with, look no further. This will get the job done quickly and rather effectively. Anyway, that's it for the video. I hope you enjoyed, but to those of you who tend to make comments regarding how I only show the best and most killful matches I have, here's one that is kind of the opposite, and it goes to show that any match can be commented upon, any match has tactical value inside of it, and every match can be taken and learned from. However, I do tend to show the ones that do have kills and do have a lot of action, because that is what people like to see. And I bet you that in the comments, even on this video, somebody will have commented about the fact that I'm reviewing a premium plane without showing a single kill. And who knows, maybe I might just take out this nostalgic beast into another match and see how well it performs when not needing to go into defensive maneuvers. Anyway, hope you enjoyed, and uh, I'll catch you in the next one.